Hello, fellow Americans. This is Mr. Steffler coming to you from room 111. I'm going to read section four of Age of Jackson, Prosperity and Panic. Main idea. Jackson's policies caused the, ec the economy to collapse after he left office and affected the next election. Why it matters now. The condition of the economy continues to affect the outcome of presidential elections. Important terms and names. Inflation. Martin Van Buren. Panic of 1837. Depression. Whig Party. William Henry Harrison. John Tyler. One American Story. Nicholas Biddle was the kind of person that Andrew Jackson neither liked nor trusted. Biddle was wealthy, well-educated, and came from a social, socially prominent Philadelphia family. He was also the influential president of the powerful Second Bank of the United States, the bank that Jackson believed to be a monster of corruption. Jackson declared war on Biddle and the bank during his... 1832 re-election campaign, but Biddle shall, felt sure of his political power. I have always deplored making the bank a political question, but since this president will have it so, we must pay, he must pay the penalty of his own rashness. My hope is that it will, be, it will contribute to the relief of the country of the domination of these miserable people. Nicholas Biddle, in a letter to Henry Clay, dated August 1st, 1832. For his part, Jackson vowed to kill the bank. In this section, you will read about how the war on the bank and the effect on the economy. Mr. Biddle's Bank. The second bank of the United States was the most powerful bank in the country. It held government funds and issued money. As its president, Nicholas Biddle set policies that controlled the, controlled the nation's money supply. Although the bank was run efficiently, Jackson had many reasons to dislike it. For one thing, he came to distrust banks after losing money in financial deals earlier in his career. He also think, thought the bank had too much power. The bank made loans to members of Congress, and Biddle openly boasted that he could influence Congress. In addition, Jackson felt that the bank's leading lending policies favored wealthy clients and hurt the average person. To operate the bank had to have a charter or a written grant from the federal government. In 1832, Biddle asked Congress to renew the bank's charter, even though it would not expire until 1836. Because 1832 was an election year, he thought Jackson would agree to the renewal rather than risk angering its supporters. But Jackson took that risk. Jackson's War on the Bank When Congress voted to renew the bank's charter, Jackson vetoed the renewal. In a strongly worded message to Congress, Jackson claimed that the bank was unconstitutional. He said that the bank was a monopoly that favored few at the expense of many. The Supreme Court earlier ruled that the bank was constitutional, but Jackson claimed elected officials had to judge the, the constitutionality of the law for themselves. They did not need to rely on the Supreme Court. His veto message also contained this attack on the bank. It is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government, but when laws undertake to make the rich richer and the prominent more powerful, and the humble members of society have the right to complain of the injustice of their government. Jackson's veto message, July 10, 1832. Jackson's war on the bank became a main issue in the presidential campaign of 1832. The National Republican Party and its candidate, Henry Clay, called Jackson a tyrant. They said that he wanted too much power as the president. The Democrats portrayed Jackson as the defender of the people. When he won re-election, Jackson took it as a sign that 
the public approved of his war on the bank. In his second term, Jackson set out to destroy the bank before its charter ended in 1836. He had government funds deposited in state banks, which opponents called Jackson's pet banks. Biddle fought back by making it harder for people to borrow money. He hoped the resulting economic troubles would force Jackson to return the government bank deposits. Instead, the people rallied to Jackson's position. Eventually, the bank went out of business. Jackson won the war, but the economy would be the victim. This is a very famous um, editorial picture of Jackson using the veto stick. This is the veto to defeat Nicholas Biddle and the hydra-headed monster of the National Bank. Prosperity becomes panic. Most of the nation prospered under Jackson's last years in office, but it was easier to borrow money. But it was easier to borrow money. People took out loans to buy public lands. The economy boomed, but the pet banks issued too much paper money, and the rise of the money supply made each dollar worth less. As a result, prices rose. Inflation, which is the increase in prices and the decrease in the value of money, was the outcome. To fight inflation, Jackson issued an order that required people to pay in gold or silver for public lands. Jackson left office proud of the nation's prosperity, but it was puffed up prosperity. Like a balloon, it had little substance. Because of Jackson's popularity, his vice president, Martin Van Buren, was elected in 1836. Within a few months, Van Buren took office. A panic, a widespread fear about the state of the economy spread through the country. It became known as the Panic of 1837. People took their money out of the banks and demanded gold and silver in exchange. The banks quickly ran out of gold and silver. When the government tried to get its money out of the state banks, the banks could not pay. The banks defaulted and went out of business. A depression or severe economic slump followed. The depression caused much hardship because people had little money. Manufacturers had no longer had customers for their goods. About 90% of the factories in the East closed in 1837. Jobless workers had no way of buying food or paying rent. People went hungry. They lived in shelters on the streets, and they froze during the winter. Every section of the country suffered, but the Depression hit hardest in the cities. Farmers were hurt less because they could at least grow their own food. The Depression affected politics, too. The rise of the Whig Party. In the depths of the Depression, Senators Henry Clay and Daniel Webster argued that the government needed help with the economy. Van Buren disagreed. He believed that the economy would improve if left alone. He argued that less government interference with private pursuits, the better for the general prosperity. Many Americans blamed Van Buren for the panic. Though he had not taken office only weeks before it started, the continuing depression made it, possible, made it impossible for him to win re-election in 1840. Van Buren faced a new political party, during Jackson's war on the bank, Clay, Webster, and other Jackson opponents had formed the Whig Party. It was named after the British party that had opposed royal power. The Whigs opposed the concentration of power in a chief executive, whom they mockingly called King Andrew Jackson. In the 1840s, the Whig chose, Whigs chose William Henry Harrison of Ohio to run for president and John Tyler of Virginia to run for vice president. The, wings no the Whigs nominated Harrison largely because of his military record and his lack of strong political views. Harrison had led the army that defeated the Shawnee in 1811 at the Battle of Tippecanoe and had been the hero in the War of 1812. The Whigs made the most, the most of Harrison's military record and nicknamed him Old Tippecanoe. The phrase was Tippecanoe and Tyler too became, became the Whigs' re-election slogan. The election of 1840. During the 1840 election, the Whigs emphasized the personalities more than the issues. They tried to appeal to the common people, as Andrew Jackson had done. Harrison, the son of a Virginia plantation owner, was the son of a Virginia plantation owner. 
However, he had settled a, a farm in Ohio, and the Whigs, such as Harrison, was a true Westerner. They used symbols of the frontier, such as a log cabin, to represent Harrison. The Whigs contrasted Harrison with the wealthy Van Buren. Harrison won in a close election. At his inauguration, the 68-year-old president spoke for nearly two hours in the cold March weather with no hat or coat. Later, he got Later, he was caught in the rain. He, he came down with a cold and developed pneumonia. On April 4th, 1841, one month after being inaugurated, Harrison died, the first president to die in office. Vice President Tyler became president. The election of 1840 showed the importance of the West in American politics. In the next chapter, you'll learn more about the lure of the West and westward expansion of the United States. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and God bless America. Boom.